pigs around the middle of the table here. Let's see. Zoom in a little more. Hang on, I just gotta get it cut. Yeah, it should be okay. Got it. Okay, here we go. Alright guys, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but it's a it's a very, very simple fly. It's got a few bits and pieces to it, as no flies normally do, but that's how I try and simplify this for you. It's a it's a fly you can tie right down to a size 16. You possibly can push it to an 18, but I've replaced the CDC thorax, which you normally have on the CDC suspended buzzers, with this foam. And what I like about the foam is it can hold up two nymphs underneath it quite easily if I'm fishing in a river. I can also hold up nymphs on a lake, no problem at all. It rides quite good in, a, in fast water and on a wave. And you don't have to retreat this fly every time you've got a fish. The problem, the, the, the really awesome stuff with the CDC is it lands very softly. But if you do get quite a few fish on it, as you know, you've got to clean it and reset it and sort it. Whereas this thing just keeps bobbing up and down all day. And you can really float quite a couple of nice flies. You can fish it on its own and you can fish it with some nymphs suspended down from it. I don't like to tie any of the, of the nymphs into the bend of the hook, the New Zealand style. I don't do that at all. So what I would do is I would have my tippet coming in, attach it to the eye, and then from there, if it's not fishing in competition, I would then attach a second piece of tippet into the eye and drop down my extra two flies or one fly accordingly. Never ever fish in New Zealand rig at all. Never, 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 never. It's just, no, it's, it's the most inefficient use of two flies ever. The only time I would ever really use it, and sometimes guiding and on a lake where you've got big dragonflies and as you know sometimes when the dragonflies like to chase other nymphs I'm sorry switch this off I would sometimes have a dragonfly nymph chasing a very small nymph but that far away and I'll only fish that on a lake and I get a lot of takes doing that but I will never ever fish a New Zealand rig anywhere any other time ever because first of all, you'll never catch two fish at the same time. Never, ever, never. I don't know anybody in the universe that's caught two fish at the same time with a New Zealand rig. And you cannot vary the depths of water and the different layers of water that you want to fish with. For me, a New Zealand rig is for people who can't tie knots and for people who can't cast. I don't want to be horrible. But that's, it's the easy way out. That's what it is. It's the easy way out. And it's the, less, the least effective of, of the ways of attaching droppers. I just came back from the Czech Republic and I, I spent three and a half weeks fishing there. I've been back about a week and a bit and we did that, Czech, that whole Czech masterclass nymphing course with some of the best fishermen I've ever fished with on the, on the planet. And I really spent a lot of time exam, examining their whole leader structures and how they make their leaders because I'm, I'm... Oh, shut up, man. Sorry, let me just switch this man off. Sorry, guys. And they, on their nymphing leader, they use a lot of tippet rings. They are the ones that actually pushed for the change in the international rules to get the tippet rings in. And I was like, quite suspect why they're using these tippet rings. And they do not put any tippet rings, or, or sorry, any of the little rings anywhere subsurface at all. So wherever you think they might have a ring on the leader which will attach a dropper, don't have them at all. They are so meticulous about the diameter of the line they fish and the kind of knots they use. So what they will use it for is the main body of their leaders. So now in competition rules, you're only allowed to fish the leader twice the length of the rod, and I think the max length of the rod now is 11 foot. So 22 foot is the longest leader you can push it onto. And their leaders are so mathematically perfect that you can actually turn them over by hand. They are brilliant. They've got a fantastic leader, tapered leader, which they, they tie themselves and they use for 
as you know, like the French nymphing, where you're fishing mainly upstream shallow water, very, very tiny nymphs, and you need a leader to turn over. If, you, if you're fishing a slightly weighted fly, that's enough to turn over or even carry most of, of the leader out. Before the changing competition rules, and I still do it now, even when I fish socially on the vol, my leader is normally running at about 12 foot, but the rest of the making up the 20 odd or 22 foot is all nylon. So you're looking at a full leader of nearly 22 foot. And if you're fishing in very shallow water with tiny nymphs, you've got to have a proper leader, tapered leader to turn those nymphs over. But if you're throwing even a 2 mil or a 1.5 tungsten bead, you can throw that 22 foot of, of nylon very easily very easily and the secret of that thing is the back cast it's not the forward cast a lot of people try and make a conventional back cast and when you're throwing such a massive piece of nylon what it does is it actually tends to wobble or if you throw it too aggressively then you're going to tangle and especially if you're fishing very very fine leader material you're going to tangle it all the time so the back cast is very important i don't want to go on about that but the checks do not put any of those tippet rings under the surface of the water at all nothing 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 they use it subsurface but nothing under the water at all so you can use them they must increase the drag by such x factor but a small percentage but they 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 say that they do not and i've seen them and i fished with them for two and a half weeks now nearly three weeks they're not one of them from we fished with three different world champions from juniors to seniors every single one of them have a tippet ring above the surface and they use that for quick changes or if the leader breaks or if they want to make some manipulation to the, lead, the leader. And what I did find about it, as small as those tippet rings are, they do actually add a bit of turnover to the, to the leader as well. So, but nothing subsurface at all. So, if, all right, so this is, this is the fly we're going to tie tonight. Very simple, very quick hooks that you use on this thing. The swimming nymph hook is... Is, is probably one of the better hooks to use it. You can put it on a caddis hook, but you've got to be careful with a caddis hook that sometimes the shape of the caddis hook is a bit difficult. One of the things that it really does work very nicely is if you can actually find the true clink hammer style hook, the one where the hook is actually bent. And I'm going to bend these hooks. I've got enough of these hooks for everybody so you can tie on these tonight. And I've specifically brought big hooks so that you can tie on them without getting too frustrated because this fly does take up quite a bit of space and you've got to get your proportions quite well planned to get this fly right. So what I'm going to do now, I'm actually putting the, uh, the hook in the vise to actually almost stand it up a little more. So this is what you're going to do when you start this evening to actually bend the hook. And you want to come back and you want to bend it a little further back than what you would conventionally expect on the normal thorax. These hooks are quite pliable so they're going to bend quite easy and they're not going to snap on you unless you're very aggressive with them. There you can see the angle of which you're looking at. So when, if you bend it more you can get the buzzer to be sitting virtually upright like that. So depending on how much of bend you put in it will determine how the buzzer is going to sit subsurface. All right, can you see that on the screen? Now, what you need to do is you need to realign the hook, and you want to now align it like you would for just a standard nymph. Straight, flat, horizontal in front of you like that. Black thread. What's going on here? It's such a tangle. Right, guys, just standard black threads, all you're going to need for tonight. It's time for glasses, unfortunately. And just try and keep, as you would with, with, with most of your fly tying, is this light affecting the, is it the right? Okay. One of the materials I like to use on this is um, is turkey bite, and as you know, turkey bite gives you the same kind of effect that you would get from 
peacock hull. But we're going to just use peacock hull for the demonstration. Now, now when you, I don't, sorry, I don't know, just tell me if I'm left, right, skew, up, down. When, you, when you're going to start working with this, you want to try and keep it very fine, but don't start close to the edge because unfortunately it always tends to break there. So I just tend to come up a little bit, trim. Okay, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, so I would, I would trim it off just about there. And then I'm going to just lay this in very softly. Not too much pressure as you know, otherwise you're going to pop this very, very fine thing on. Now, if you're tying these to fish with, and you are going to, you are going to use the, the, um, the turkey bites, they're almost the same as this and the same kind of effect that you would get from pheasant tail. You know, you get that one side of the fiber is very, very fine. Because it's such a fine, delicate material, what I, what I sometimes like to do when I'm, fi when I'm tying these for fishing, I will just put a soft little run of super glue on there. You don't want to put too much super glue that it actually now starts to saturate your feather and your feather loses that fine fiber. And those fibers are almost like the breathing filaments that you're looking for on the, on, on, on the side of the insect. So you would, you'd want to put on a very, very soft amount of super glue. And then when you start your ribbing, don't lay Curry guys, can you see what I'm doing there? Don't lay the wraps next to one another because if you lay the wraps next to one another like you would on a willy bagger or some sort of more conventional fly, the fly becomes overdressed and bulky. You want to almost use this as a ribbing where you've got space between each wrap. And now you can see how nice and fine it is. Very much so. I, I I do that on some of them. You just gotta one thing you gotta just make sure that if you if you put that um, the flash uh, flash underneath, your ribbing really 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 needs to be really good so that you get a really nice finish on the flies. Yeah. If your spacing is wrong, your fly looks poor. I mean, some people doesn't they don't really mind, but. So no ribbing in terms of wire. I find that if you put wire ribbing on it, it tends to overlay it, and I don't like the effect that it gives. So a little bit of super glue, and you're away. Now you want to realign your hook. Now you're going to bring it up that your thorax is virtually up on the horizontal. And I'm just going to take a couple of turns forward. Now, with this fly... Can we, are we seeing that? Yeah. All right. You can see I've got a little bit of transparent flash that goes over the top of the wing case. You don't need to put that in at all. But I like it, and I find that sometimes, especially when you're not fishing too far away from me, that the sun, if you're in the right light conditions, the sun actually sparkles off that, and it does help you see it a lot more. And it just, and it, for me, it just gives that fly that something extra and something special. The fish can't see it but it really helps me see the fly a lot better. And you can use many color combinations that you can see. So in order to get that effect, you first need to come in and you need to put some of this transparent flash down. You're gonna lay that down first. It is quite wide. When you're working with it, you, you're welcome to trim it a bit and if you've got the patience to trim it, because it's very difficult stuff to work with because it's so fine. Now when I'm, when I'm going to wrap it, I'm going to actually start to push it down the shank of the hook so that it doesn't distort too much. If I hold it up on the horizontal like that, sometimes it starts to distort. And I don't like the finish it gives when it distorts. So I'm going to just wrap it really carefully. And you see I'm pushing the flash down. I'm not going any further then my tie off point where I've bent my hook. Now, the amount or the volume of foam that you put on is obviously dependent on the fly, that the size of the hook that you're using, but you can actually oversize this as well. Be careful of not putting foam on that doesn't actually do its job because you might put some foam on and it doesn't actually support the fly at all and then you've got this really nice orange wing case but that's all it is it doesn't actually float the fly at all and as you all know working with foam you can stretch it you can manipulate it i don't 
I don't manipulate this foam too much, but I'm just going to give it a little bit of a point. Now, when you tie it in, you do not want to tie it too close, or you don't want to trap it in too close to the end of that. You actually want to bring it almost halfway into your thorax. That's important, because if you tie it in too close to the back, what happens is you then create that valley, that ridge that goes down. So then you're going to have a taper going down towards the eye of your hook. And when you try and start to put the other materials on, they all slide forward. So try not to put the, the foam too far back. Tie it in. And now, as you know, guys, this foam, it likes to spin. It likes to actually, like now I can see it's almost, you see it's laying towards me. And it's going to start to go skew. So you now it's very important that you actually manipulate this foam. You want to make sure that it's laying as flat as possible. Because if the foam is skew, when you bring it forward, the wing case is skew. And roll your vise so that you can see underneath exactly where your end point is. And that's where I want to be. Now I'll come back and I'll just tighten it down a little. And hopefully you can see that you've got quite a long piece of foam tied in there. Now I've got quite a level platform on which to work. Sometimes you make the mistake of tying that foam in too short and all the rest of it runs forward and then you have some problems. Tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of dubbing. The dubbing is quite important now. Don't forget about the dubbing now because what's going to happen is this dubbing, besides giving a nice neat finish on that joint there, it also going to help in the actual alignment of the wings. If you don't have the dubbing in, the wings tend to come and push underneath the fly. So the dubbing helps align the wings a little easier. Dubbing easy, huh? This dubbing that we're using here is the ice dub pheasant tail. And, oh, I'm sorry, you can see that. It's, a, it's, it's really one of my favorites, especially for the vol. This, this particular pattern that I'm showing you now with lots of flash and stuff on it is very very effective on the wall. Right now I'm going to show you a very very simple way of making wings, little wing buds. Again you probably don't even need to put these wing buds in. I don't think it really affects the fish that much but for me my flies need to try and be as real, not as realistic as possible but they got to have that something special. When I went out I went out with the Northern Kauteng guys last Sunday to, for a practice and one of the guys showed me his fly box and I mean, he's been around a million years and he's fished a million things and he's a good fisherman and he showed me his fly box and I thought after all those years I don't want my fly box to look like that. It was so depressing because, and I'm not being nasty, there was just no love or creativity or spark or freshness or it was just a caddis, you know, and there was nothing new, nothing creative, and I just thought, sure, I mean, they catch fish, but flip me, if you're a fly tire, you want to you want to be creative, you want it to be brilliance in your flies. So you've got to, you know, I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm extreme, and I'm trying to cut back on being too technical with my flies, because they've got to catch fish firstly. But secondly, they must look beautiful. If they don't look beautiful, then I don't care how many fish they catch, I don't put them in my box. So. <laughs> right, now what I do is this, I'm not going to be able to show you on, on the camera, but this makes a huge difference. A standard piece of saltwater flash boo. That's all this is. Okay. Right? Standard piece of saltwater flash boo. Now you can cut this and you can shape it and you can make a wing out of it, but when you look at it, it looks like a standard piece of flash boo. So, what I do with them, and I'll show you the examples of these little flies later, is I lay them down on my base of my vise and I take this little pin and you just got to work out how much pressure you're going to put on with a pin because if you put too much pressure on you're going to cut through it and it's going to split open. You just, if you can have a look at my finger, I don't start pulling down the center because what happens is if I start pulling this pin down the center it tends to make a groove and every other pull that I put falls back into that groove. So I try and, as small as that is, I try and start on either of the sides and I pull down like this and you just go quick and random and it makes the most beautiful soft little veins and it gives you such a pretty 
and it takes you a couple of seconds and that's the kind of special stuff that makes your flies worthwhile having in your box as opposed to just a whole lot of caddises that look like they're sleeping bags. I'm going to cut this into the shape now of the wing and I'm going to, before I tie it in, I just want you to have a, a pass it around, have a look at it guys. And as you can see in the light, but it makes such a huge difference just to put those little veins in. And you can do it with so many different materials. When you're working with lots and lots of different materials and you want to create just some little bit more natural effect. And what I'll actually do sometimes as well is I'll actually just give it a a little bit of a squeezing and then straighten it out again. It just adds a little bit more creases to it, but it makes it look a bit more natural. Now, when I'm going to tie this wing in, can we see that? Yeah. It must be long side down, short side up. All right. Everybody see that on the screen? Long side is down. This way, the wrong way around all right so we want to have like that that's where we want to have it and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to place that wing you do not want the wings to lay too flat against the side of the body that you actually can't see them you want to try and put the wing that it's slightly angled down If the flash wraps around the hook like it's done now, what I do is I just make sure I secure it in place. And you'll see the wing obviously on the other side. Can you see that wing there now? And you see how that wing standing slightly away from the body and it's slightly down from the body. You don't want it to come parallel to the body and tuck into the body. That's where that dubbing pushes the wing out slightly and as I say it gives you a nice neat finish between the, the, the joint of the thorax and the abdomen quick quick with a pin it takes you a few seconds right we're putting long side down again and this is the this is probably the only tricky part of this whole fly is just aligning these wings but it's, if you find that the one wing is pressed in a little like this one is here now, just move it out. And there you have your wing. Two wings set very quickly, very easily. But again, going back to the fact that it's sitting on the actual bed of the foam. If I cut the foam, if I tie the foam too far back, everything's going to be sliding down, and because it's so narrow, the wings are going to want to tuck in under. Tiny, tiny little bit of dubbing again, just a small amount, just to get a nice, neat finish there. I want to hide all the way uh, that black cotton away. When you do that, just make sure, turn your, turn your vise to make sure that you haven't thrown any of the wings out of alignment because it's very easy to actually squash one of the wings down or up. Now you can see where wings are really nicely set. Bit of CDC. Oh, I've got some here somewhere too. This is the last piece of material that goes on this fly. What I like to do with this is I don't like to overdress the fly that there are too many legs that it actually starts to look like a soft hackle. But what I will do is I will put on slightly more CDC when I spin it because it's easy to take CDC out. Once it's in, it's in. You can't do anything about it. So I will, as you get better at tying these flies, you will be able to determine how much CDC you want. I always like to cut the 
cut the CDC level on the top. I hate it when one piece of CDC is longer than the other and one's this long and then you look at the fly and it's got a leg down here and a leg down there. CDC is one of the feathers that you can cut or trim with your fingers that still looks pretty natural. And I'm going to use a fair amount of it in that section over there. And you all, I mean, everybody knows how to spin. It's one of the, probably the, one of the most important techniques in your fly tying. Also, you can determine the length that you want. You can determine the length of you want before you actually cut it off. I pretty much know that I want it to come from that tying point just about two or three mils past the back of the hook. I don't want it to be too long past the back of the hook. If you've got, if you've got cotton that you can split, this, this thread you can't split because it's a, it's a twisted thread, so I'm going to just spin it with a conventional loop. Again, be careful that you don't unalign any of your wings. One of the little things that, and I see a lot of people tying lots of flies, what they do is they create the loop first, and then they only come back and want to do the clamp. Now, you've either got to hook this somewhere and do something with it. Always make sure that whatever material you're going to spin is prepared first. Then you don't have to find a place to support the, the loop. The loop is already in one finger. Now I've got more CDC in there than I'm possibly going to need, but I'm putting it in there specifically so that you guys can see that you can actually trim it off. What I do like about the, this is I can actually control the speed of the spin. Once that's on, make sure you don't work further back and go back into the area where your wings are tied off. You just want to bring out all your CDC, tying it back. And I'm virtually going as close to the, the same tying spot as, as I can. I don't want to work too far forward with the CDC. Now you can see there's a huge volume of CDC on there. Much, much too much CDC. But as I said, I specifically put it in like that so you can see. Overdressing the fly is a big problem that we South Africans have. So many of our flies that you look at are overdressed. They are too fat, number one, so proportions are poor. Not everybody, I'm generalizing now, I mean we've got some magnificent fly ties in this country, but generally as a generalization, our flies are too fat, and I even saw it again when I, when I fished overseas now, and our flies are too bulky. We've got too many materials, and we hammer them and we put them on. So now I'm going to just make sure I get all of these materials back underneath where I want them to be. And then these that are coming up towards the top, I always take them off. If you want to put the white feelers in, which again just adds to the, to the overall effect on authenticity of the fly. I just take a little bit of floss and double it over. So I just take a piece of floss, double it over, and then you don't want to tie it in short in the front. You've got to tie it in so that it fits into the thorax area and you can leave it long for the time being because you'll trim that off in a second. Just clean up. Tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of dubbing, and then it's just a wing case, and you're done. Okay, now wing case is going to come over. What you can do is you can push the wing case slightly back if you want to have a really fat thorax that you really want to suspend some, some fat little nymphs underneath that can hold up a good 2 mil, 3 mil, well 3 mil, but a good 2 mil tungsten bead. When you get to putting the, the thread on now, try and turn your vise and see where your tying point is. You want to come back away from the eye of the hook because if you tie this down too close to the eye of the hook and then you cut it off, and you now you've got to wrap it down and you've got to finish the head off, you're going to end up over the eye of the hook. 
you have to come back slightly further from your tying point. And then I'd like to turn my vice, and I've given myself a fair, I've probably got three or four mils of good space to work with here. So I'm not going to be tying into the eye of the hook. When you've got everything centered, turn your hook in the vise that allows you to see exactly where your tie-off point is. Because if you're holding it up like this, you can't see underneath. So I want to have a look from here like this, and I can see exactly where my tying point is. Then we don't cut the, the foam just yet. I bring the flash over the top, make sure that it's spread evenly. Just align it. Check that you're happy with everything because once you cut this, that's it. Come in, just trim everything nice and neat. Right now, what do you what do you want to do is you want to just trap the thorax in your left hand and you just give it a little pull and then you come in with your blade and you just search it out and cut it as tight as you can. And you can shape it a little bit, be careful you don't cut your thread because it's very easy to cut your thread now, I'm really right on top of that thread. But I'm trying to take off that excess that's going to make the head too bulky. This flash on the top just adds that something special to this fly and besides the fact that you can actually see where this fly is bobbing along in the river before you just whack on tons and tons of threads see what you can take off just to help keep the bulk down and then you can build up a decent sized head takes quite a bit of wraps to cover this thing up properly. Again, I like to just turn the vise and see what I'm missing. Because you don't want to put thread where it shouldn't be. Like sometimes you put a th one wrap slightly back and then it pinches into the foam and you've got this ugly piece laying on the back. Head cement. I'm sure everybody knows you rather put the head cement on the actual thread than on the on the fly itself when you finish tying it off. This gives you a much stronger finish and a much neater finish. You're not running around here with a bob a bodkin trying to now try not to put any of the of the head cement onto what's going to be the, the breathing filament. So you can see it's just grabbing it there. So I'm just trying to keep it away there now. Three or four turns is more than enough. always finish off underneath. You don't want to see any of these little tags sticking out on the front or the side. Now you must determine how long you want these breathing filaments to be. Again, you want to try and get them as natural. You can slightly exaggerate them. I'm just checking that everything's done. Now when I cut these things, I always bring my one hand underneath this one because to try and do it like this, you can't see what you're doing. And then support your support your hand on there, and then you can determine whatever the length is that you feel you need. Like for me, that I slightly exaggerate them. But you see how my left hand is supported against the vise, and my right hand is on top of the actual left hand. Because now, if I've made them slightly longer, which I've deliberately done, and now I want to come and cut them, and as you know, as soon as you cut, they push and they move. So you must make sure that when you cut these things, you cut them the right way. If you've cut them too long, turn the vice upside down, and it's easier to cut them this way. You cut slightly away and slightly away that way. Because if you try and cut them this way, you're going to find that the material pushes against the blades and it goes off to the far side, and then the far side always ends up longer. And then you can come in with a little bit of Velcro, and you just give a very soft rub, and you will then have that fly. That's it. Very simple, very effective fly. It catches a lot of fish for me. You can tie it in many, many different color variations. You can tie them really, really small. 
what I do like to use for the body, as I said, is, um, is, is goose bite. Very much like pheasant tail, very much like peacock curl, but very, it, it's finer, much, much finer. It's a beautiful material to work with. Not always easy to find a good quality, though. But that's a fly which is based on the same principle as a CDC emerger, but you do not have to worry about treating it, drying it, working with it. This foam, this foam thorax holds up a good weight of, of fly. And when, you, when, you're on, when you're on a lake in the summer and you've got lots of small canis and stuff hatching and buzzes and things happening, I fish this thing with two droppers underneath it and it's fantastic. And, and I'll fish this thing and I can chuck it out, I can drift it in the wind, I can twitch it, I can do lots and lots of things with this. As I say, never New Zealand rig, don't like it at all. And another thing I don't like about the New Zealand rig is that when you're tying into the bend of the hook, if the fish does come from behind, he's got a chance of bumping into that, into that tippet, which I don't like. And then just check, your, check the alignment of all the small things. Just make sure that the legs are all pretty much the same length. And you see, even though I started off with quite a big batch of CDC on my clip, once I had spun it, I just softly managed the ones that I wanted and the ones that I didn't want. Put in more than you when, you, when you're not experienced, put in slightly more than what you expect because you'll see if you put in less, it doesn't have the same effect. I'd rather have too many and I can cut some out as opposed to have too little because once you've got too little, you bug it. You can't go back on the steps. It just doesn't help. And there's very, very simple flower with lots and lots of different variations. And I, I've brought two other little caddises, which after the, the evening, if anybody wants to come and have a look at them, I use these on the Vol a lot as, as, as caddis emerges, and they're based very much on the same principle of what I showed you in this thorax. Just this way, oh, sorry. Okay, how's that? Up, up, up. up, up. Good? Okay. The thorax on these two caddis emerges is virtually identical in tying steps as the thorax on this buzzer emerger. Okay. All right. So the same tying steps apply for these two flies, and you can you can you can really just use your imagination. And, and there's nothing technical about these flies. These flies take slightly longer to tie than a normal conventional caddis or possibly a normal conventional suspended buzzer, but they're quick and easy. And once you get the hang of this, I whack these things out in three, four minutes. I really hammer them fast. And these, where are we? Somebody tell me where I am. Okay. How's that? Is that all Ganza or in there? There's a Ganza in the back in the legs. You see the you see the pearl the white pearl organza in the back in the legs, and it's got CDC in it as well. The body is made out of wool, flash, and just pure vinyl that you can get from any sign sign maker in the thorax. And vinyl you can use for bodies, you can use for wings, you can use for thoraxes, wing cases. I've got tons of vinyl. I use it for all different things. And this these two caddises have even got lead wire in them around the thorax area, but you can still see how slim they are, and they taper nice and neatly to the back. They don't look like big, fat-ass girls on a bicycle that's looking horrible. Eh? Nothing worse than a guy shows you a cat is in the backside it's this big. Oh, All right, guys. Thank you. Yes, some hooks for everybody.